Hello, Bad M107 students. Here we go with Chapter 3. We've completed Chapter 1, the introduction to the course, Chapter 2 on torts, and now we're getting into contract law and risk management. Um, <clears throat> before we actually get into the meat of the course, I think I have to talk a bit about the what we call the binding elements of a contract. Um, <clears throat> Authors are all over the maps with these. Um, how many binding elements are there to a contract? Um, <clears throat> we are going to take the approach that there's six binding elements. Offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations, um, capacity, and legality of object. Okay, and this is on slide 84, I believe. Yeah, slide 84 of the lecture guide. Um, when you go down that list, I think a lot of people will be surprised to find out when they have a contract and when they don't. For example, I say to you, I'll sell you my car for $7,000, and you say, I accept. Well, I have not given you my car yet, nor have you paid for it. Do we have a contract? In actual fact, we do, which comes as a surprise to some students. Um, yes, we do. Why? Because I made an offer, you accepted, we have consideration. Now, the concept of consideration means we both must be receiving something from the contract. Well, you haven't received the contract yet, and I haven't paid you for it yet, but we have received the promises of the other, okay? So I promise to give you the car, you promise to pay me. It means the consideration is there to go both ways and make it binding. Um, so at the bottom of slide 84, I've put a note in there. Nowhere does it say that payment, performance of services, or delivery of goods is necessary for a binding contract. And when we think this through, it makes a lot of sense because um, businesses get pro product um, delivered to them on 30, 60, 90 day terms. In other words, I'm going to get the product, I'm going to sell it. When I get my money, I pay you for the product and I've got some profit left over. Well, I would never receive product from you if we didn't have a contract. Because you'd give me the product and I'd sell it and say, well, we don't have a contract, so too bad because, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I haven't paid you for it. Well, that doesn't make sense. To facilitate business, obviously, we just have to have this exchange of promises. The materials in the, uh, in the textbook, um, when I was researching um, this concept of how many elements in a contract they are, I found that authors were all over the map. Um, there was uh, no consistency. One of the uh, leading textbooks, to uh, the, the one that I, I took when I was uh, in undergraduate, uh, years and then when I first started teaching at Capilano College, the very expensive textbook um, listed six binding elements, the ones I've just mentioned. Um, well, other authors come out with their textbooks and they have to differentiate their product from someone else. So some textbooks, for example, and articles on the internet, um, there was one that has offer acceptance consideration and doesn't mention intention to create legal relations, really. Just the first three. Another author has um, offer and acceptance um, lumped as one element, uh, consideration, capacity, and then puts in consent. And you think, oh, consent must be the intention to create legal relations. And then when you begin to read it, you realize, no, by consent, they means we must have freely consented to the contract and if there's any duress, undue influence, or misrepresentation, then we don't have a contract. Well, I, th I think that's not, not the best way to approach it because um, what, they're, what they're saying is um, there is no contract unless I freely consented and there's those other factors. The problem is the misrepresentation, undue influence, and uh, duress are ways that contracts can be set aside as unenforceable. So in other words, there is a contract um, without this consent element. Um, so they're missing intention to create legal relations. 
um, and then they call um, legality of object um, a lawful purpose. Okay, and then there's another one that has only five binding elements. They have consensus, consideration, intention, uh, legality, and capacity. Well, what they've done under consensus is combined offer and acceptance, <laughs> which I, you know, it's just uh, my textbook is better than the other one and it's different because of this. Um, anyway, uh, uh, and then there was there was one other one that actually listed offer, acceptance, uh, consideration, intention as the four binding elements of a contract. And then when you started reading through the chapter, you got to the point where all of a sudden it said, um, oh, and the other two things that are necessary are capacity and legality of object. Well, if they're necessary, then obviously there's got to be elements. So when the dust settles, I think the best approach is the one where we say um, uh, <clears throat> the six binding elements are as set out in the uh, slide 84. Now, there are some things that you I think you absolutely have to take away from the course and remember. And so in the past, I've actually put a question on the exam that said, list the six binding elements of the contract and blanks or wrong answers will be taken away from right, correct answers. And I was astounded that people would go, mm, offer, acceptance, uh, capacity, uh, legality. And um, instead of getting five marks, um, they wound up getting two because offer and acceptance, capacity and legality are fine, but you take away intention and consideration and suddenly you're down to two. So they're getting a two out of five. And I was astounded. So heads up, right off the bat, I don't know whether that will be on the exam or not, but you had better know the six binding elements of a contract. All right, next slide. Um, starts off with the definition of a contract. A voluntary agreement between two parties uh, that is enforceable in court. And that's, <laughs> that's dodging the bullet a little bit because what you're saying is, and, and this actually came from a very famous late 1800s case where uh, one of the best judges of all time, Lord Herschel of the House of Lords, uh, was asked to define a contract. And he spent hours and hours trying to figure out how to do it. Finally, he said, to define a contract, I would have to write a textbook. So, <coughs> pardon me, suffice it to say that it's a promise or set of promises that, that are, are enforceable. Um, so let's not worry about that. Let's just use that as the basic definition of a contract. Contracts may be verbal, written, or partly written and partly verbal. A verbal contract, I'll say in the car for $7,000, I accept, bingo, bango, no problem. Written contracts are generally part of the first part here and after referred to as part of the second part, long and more formal contracts. And then there's some where people will send a letter uh, outlining uh, that they want to go into this agreement and then they'll have some verbal terms. Um, all of these are enforceable, but obviously a verbal contract is harder to prove um, but if you can, it's still enforceable. Now, let's say I say I, I, to, a, to a judge, I offered to sell Dwayne my car. And Dwayne accepted. And Dwayne says, he said, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. And, and I said, well, if you, you know, ever make up your mind, let me know. So there was no contract. The judge has to make a decision. He can't say, oh, well, I don't know who's telling the truth and who's lying or whether your memories are just confused. And so I'm just not going to make a decision. He has to make a decision or she has to make a decision. So what the judges do is on a balance of probabilities, which we've already talked about, they don't accuse either party of, um, of lying, uh, committing perjury, um, because uh, most often than not, it's confused memories as opposed to intentional lying, okay? So they don't accuse you of lying, but what they do is they say, I believe the veracity of the testament, testimony of Peter Holden over Dwayne Thompson, okay? Um, veracity just means the believability, okay? Um, he had uh, made some uh, notes on a piece of paper or uh, so he has uh, some evidence contemporaneous with the event or um, 
uh, you know, he just has a better understanding of what happened when they met. And so they, they find out about balance of probabilities. Um, obviously, what you want to do is in contracts search for certainty. Um, and when we do the drafting contract assignment for this course, look at the terms. What one party is saying to the other party and saying, and say to yourself, is that clear or does it need further clarification in the written contract? Okay, because the, the point of a written contract is for to have details for certainty because memories fade. All right, first element, offer, a uh, clear and unequivocal offer from one party called the offeror to the other party called the offeree to enter into an agreement on certain terms and conditions. That's really all we have to say about that. But we do have to distinguish an offer from something called an invitation to treat. Uh, goods on a shelf with a price tag or goods um, in a catalog or um, a flyer or goods on the internet um, are not offers. So there's the, the item, there's the price, but the business isn't offering to sell it at that price. What they're saying is, this is an invitation for you to come in and make me an offer. And the, um, the efficacy of that really stems from um, a case in England called the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus Boots Cash Chemistry. Um, a lot of pharmacies in, uh, in continental Europe and in, and in England um, are not like our pharmacies. <laughs> our pharmacies, you go into London Drugs and there's uh, cookies and bread and there's candies and there's cosmetics and there's kitchenware and there's magazines and there's cameras and there's computers and there's some bicycles and, and you know, like where's the pharmacy? Oh, it's in the back corner, okay? Um, so they, they do much more than just sell drugs. In, uh, in the United Kingdom, a lot of stores, uh, pharmacies are just small shops and they sell nothing but pharmaceutical drugs. Okay, so England passes a law that says um, uh, any prescription drug can only be sold under the supervision of a pharmacist. Um, we have that law, and you see it in TV, uh, particularly in the American TVs, where they come up with, uh, uh, you know, some nasal sp spray, and they say, uh, you know, this is Flanax, and you'll be able to breathe clearly. And then, you know, 20 minutes of, of uh, they list all the side effects, you know. You know, if your nose begins to bleed, if you lose your eyesight, if your left ear falls off, if you feel numbness in your leg or palpitations of the heart, um, you know, <clears throat> consult your physician immediately and stop taking the drug. And, and you know, the drug could, in very rare cases, cause uh, stoppage of the heart. And, and, you know, you're sitting there thinking, like, you know, who would ever take that drug? Well, they have to give those warnings. And we'll get into that later. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but right right. Uh, no, we've already covered duty to warn in uh, torts. So uh, they have to give that warning. Um, and so this this law passed by the um, United Kingdom Parliament was to say, okay, we're, we're going to take it a step further. Not only do you have to give that warning, of course, but the pharmacy should really take responsibility for giving you some advice. Uh, all right, so they, they passed this law, and um, <clears throat> a diligent civil servant skulks around the streets of London finds a pharmacy, goes in, looks around the shelves, finds one of these prescription drugs with a price tag, goes up to the counter and gives it to the clerk and puts down his six bob three or whatever the heck the English money is and says, um, uh, I'd like to buy this, please. The clerk is not a pharmacist. She looks down and she sees that it's a uh, one of those drugs and she says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'll have to get the pharmacist because that uh, uh, you know, has to be sold under his supervision. And the, and the civil servant goes, aha, gotcha. <clears throat> you, you know, I've already bought it. I brought it up. I gave you the money. You've broken the law. You're not a pharmacist. <laughs> off he goes to file a complaint. Well, they get into court. And right off the bat, you're, you see that the judge's bias uh, isn't in favor of pharmaceutical industry or of the person. The judge's bias, natural bias is, what was the law intended to do? The law was intended to prevent the sale of this without the pharmacist saying, you know, you have to be careful with it. Take two pills, 
three times a day with milk, you know, two hours after a full moon, uh, you know, with a dog barking, something like that. <laughs> anyway, um, so he's already in, sort of in favor of uh, Boots Cash Chemist. Now he has to put it into legal terms. And so what he, he looked at the six binding elements of a contract and he says, okay, offer an acceptance. Um, goods on a shelf with a price tag uh, aren't offers, they're invitations for the person buying to come in and make an offer to the pharmacist. Then if they accept the money, um, they're, they're accepting the uh, customer's offer. But the clerk didn't accept the money. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll have to get the pharmacist. All right. So the law was working. And so this concept of invitation to treat um, makes a lot of sense. And um, in Canada, it's called invitation to treat. It's also called invitation to do business. Um, but there was a, um, uh, a case that... Um, uh, concerning uh, Bermuda Holdings LTD, which was a used car lot, and it had all these cars for sale, um, and the law a law was passed. Um, gosh, let's see, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but it said that that um, the cars could only be sold um, if they were properly licensed. And the person comes in, he wants to buy a car. And uh, gosh golly gee, what happens is um, they, uh, they sell him the car and then they go to license the car. And <clears throat> the police officer said, uh, you're under arrest because, um, uh, you know, I, bu I bought this car and, uh, and you were going to license it later. So, <clears throat> and, and again, it got down to, well, um, when was the money given and when was it accepted? And um, uh, they apply the same rule, this uh, invitation to treat. Um, another case, uh, the a law was passed that you could not sell switchblades. Those are those knives where you go, and then comes the blade, you know, you're cool. <clears throat> and um, uh, they passed the law, and in uh, one of the stores, there was a display of knives all the way around this big wheel. And it started off with those little wee knives that your grandpa always has in his pocket. He pulls it out and cuts a package open for you. And then it goes all the way up to switch blades and hunting knives and, and you know, goes all the way around to Bowie knives, which are basically, you know, Jim Bowie at the uh, Alamo in the United States had this knife that was about as long as a sword. And they had a display with price tags on it, and this law is passed, and the um, owner of the store forgot that there was a switchblade on there. And so in comes an RCMP officer, and he says, um, here's my money, I'm buying that switchblade. And the owner of the store says, oh, oh, sorry, that's a mistake, I can't sell that, it's against the law. The RCMP officer says, ah, too late, I bought it, you're under arrest. Well, again, you can see the bias of the court is, hey, wait a minute, um, had he said, oh, hey, you know, uh, not supposed to sell that to you, but okay, then he was breaking the law. But when the fellow gave him the money and said, I want to buy that, and he said, no, I can't, cannot sell it to you, the law was working, all right? And so the judge said the knife with a price tag was an invitation to treat. The police officer was making the offer. <clears throat> the store owner said, no, no contract, no acceptance. Ergo, the law hasn't been broken. And you can see how that makes uh, uh, sense. All right. Um, slide 88. Um, now we have um, offer, offers that are made. Um, I make you an offer. Does that offer sort of float around in cyberspace um, for all time? Or can the offer come to an end? Well, obviously, there's numerous ways that offers can come to an end. Um, I'll sell you my car for $7,000. No, I don't want it. Well, that offer comes to an end, all right? You come back five days later and you say, um, oh, by the way, I want to buy your car. And I say, oh, I already sold it. And he said, no, no, you made an offer and I'm now accepting. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. So you can reject it. Counter offer, I'll sell you my car for $7,000. And, you know, you want to... You, you want to be smart with me and so you go ah professor holden i've seen that car uh you know it's uh you know i'll give you a hundred bucks for it ha, 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 ha. now i'm upset right and so i say no and then you say okay um 
um, you know, I'll buy it for 7000 Now I'm mad at you and I don't want to sell it. Do I have to? Because I said I'd sell it to you for $7,000 and you're accepting. No, I don't. Because the counter offer, um, as we'll see on the next screen, a counter offer extinguishes an offer and it is no longer to be accept available to be accepted unless I reiterate it. Okay, I'll sell you my car for seven thousand dollars. No, but I'll pay you six. No, seven. Okay, you accept. Well, uh, I've reiterated my offer, so I'm bound to that contract. Lapse of an offer. <clears throat> uh, offers can lapse in two ways. They can laugh lapse at a specified time. So I'll sell you my car. Uh, let me know by five o'clock Friday. Five o'clock Friday comes, I don't hear from you. I sell it to my niece at seven o'clock. Saturday morning you come by, okay, I'll, I'll buy the car. Now, if you could do that, then I would be stuck because I've now sold the same car to two people. So that doesn't make any sense. My offer lapses at five o'clock. What happens though, if I say, I'll sell you my car for $7,000 and you say, let me think about it. Now, I have not specified a time when my offer comes to an end. So the question then becomes, when does it come to an end or does it ever come to an end? And the law has taken the position that the offer will lapse after a reasonable period of time. Now, that's dangerous, okay? Because what's going to happen is you're going to wind up in court where some stodgy old judge is now going to decide what's reasonable and what isn't. Um, so you pretty much always want to put a time limit into an offer if it's not accepted immediately. Um, so what's reasonable? Well, um, cars, in good times, you can see them on the side of the road with a, a for sale sign on them, and they can be there for weeks, and perhaps months. Um, and so, and, and that's in good times. Now, I can imagine in the United States with people out of money everywhere, the people that have lost their jobs will be trying to sell cars and trucks and, and uh, you know, uh, bicycles and everything to try to get some money. Um, and yet the, the COVID uh, virus is going to be with us for months and months and months and months and months. So the, and those cars are going to sit around there because do I want to buy a car and you know in the you know from somebody and risk getting infected and so um, it may well be that an offer um, will not lapse for three months, okay? Um, and yet uh, another example is um, I have raspberries for sale, okay? So I'll say I'll sell you a um, hundred flats of raspberries at uh, five dollars a flat. And uh, you say, I'll get back to me. Well, if you get back to me in three or four days, I no longer have flats of raspberries for sale. I have mold or raspberry juice if they've squished. Okay, so because the raspberries are perishable, what is uh, reasonable is uh, a question of fact. Well, in those circumstances, a much tighter time period would be reasonable. Um, all right, so I come into class if there was a class to come into and I say to the class as a whole, um, um, I'll sell you my car for $7,000. Um, you know, if anybody's interested, let me know. Nobody talks to me that class, so I go away. I go back to my office and uh, Robert Thompson, my office mate, says to me, uh, Peter, I hear your car is for sale. I'll give you eight grand for it. Well, I'd sell. I'd rather sell it to him for eight than to you for seven. So I say, sure, Robert, and I sell him, sell him the car. I then walk back into the next class the next day, and you pop up and you say, um, Professor Holden, I'll buy your car. And I say, oh, I'm sorry, I've already sold it. Well, I'm gonna be sorry, all right, because now I've sold the same car twice. Um, Robert gets the car for eight, um, and you don't get a car, so you can sue me. Now, what would you get? Um, what are your damages? So you have to look for damages. Well, you go out and you buy a comparable car and you have to pay $10,000. You could have bought mine for seven, but you had to pay 10. Now you've got a car, 
but you're short $3,000. So the judge would then make an award of $3,000 to you. So I will have sold my car to uh, Robert Thompson for eight, and I have to pay you three. Okay, okay that's revocation. So, or, so, you know, what do I do in a situation like that? Um, I see you in class, I'll sell you my car, $7,000, I go away, I sell it to Robert Thompson, and then um, <clears throat> I turn around and I come walking back into class, and before I walk in and say, you know, good afternoon class, I walk in and I say, I revoke my offer. Right off the bat, I revoke my offer. And you say, oh no, but I wanted to buy your car. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't have to sell it to you because um, a revocation brings the offer to an end. All right. So um, I guess um, we back up and we look at this slide and it shows um, four ways that an offer can come to an end. And we're going to talk about a fifth way, uh, not directly um, it comes to an end. Um, it really doesn't exist to begin with. <clears throat> and so we'll have a rejection, a counter offer, lapse of an offer, a revocation, and vague offers, right? So that would make a good five mark exam question, part B exam question. You know, uh, list and explain these. Uh, some textbooks say, well, a discharge of, uh, uh, b discharge by performance brings an offer to an end. So if I sell you a quart of milk and you pay me and you drink the milk, the, the contract comes to an end. But I don't think it automatically comes to an end until uh, per discharged by performance. Uh, for example, if I gave you the milk and you gave me the money and you opened it up and went to drink it and it was sour, well, if giving you the milk and getting the money brought the contract to an end, you wouldn't be able to sue me because you don't have a contract, okay? So I think it has to be, uh, the performance would have to be something in consideration of drinking the milk and having it okay. Um, so I, th I think discharge by performance is a bit of a semantics because um, <clears throat> if I sell you my car and you give me the money and you drive the car for a week or two and you think, okay, you know, <laughs> what's that noise? And you find out there's you know, a real problem with it and it was something that I knew about, and you asked me if there are any problems, and this is a misrepresentation, right? Well, the misrepresentation, um, the contract still better be in existence, otherwise you won't be able to say, I want the contract uh, set aside because of misrepresentation. So I think discharge by performance is um, yeah, really is, is not a way that contracts come to an end. However, uh, vague offers um, <clears throat> are... Uh, a situation where um, what you appears to have been an offer and appears to have been accepted, um, the offer wasn't there to begin with. Okay, uh, let me explain. Um, the case there was a case where there were two two pieces of land, uh, farmland, and A wanted to buy them, and so he said to the owner B, um, "I will buy." lot A, and I will lease lot B. I will give you some money, and I will give you um, part of the first year's crop to complete the purchase. And B said, I accept, and then A backed out of the deal, and B sued him, and they get into court, and the judge says, okay, I'm a little confused here. You've got lot A and lot B, and you say, I want to buy this one and lease this one, and I'll pay you some money and give you half the crop. Is that half the crop from the lot that you're buying, or half the crop from the lot that you're leasing, or half the crop from both? And are you going to um, immediately get title to the land, or do you get title to the land only after uh, you've raised the crops and, and paid, paid the money? Uh, the judge said there are too many unanswered uh, questions about this offer. So that offer is too vague to amount to an offer at all. All right. So I think it's a rejection, a counter offer, lapse of an offer, revocation, and vague offer are the five ways that offers can come to an end. Then there's also something that you have to talk about, and it's contracts to enter into a contract. A party's attempt to enter into a contract with a fundamental term to be agreed upon at a later date. 
So for example, I say, I'll show you my car next week at a fair price. And you say, fine, great. Do we have a contract? Mm, no. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and it and it may well be that uh, well let's let's change it a bit. I'll I'll give you my car now uh, to use, and um, I'll I'll sell you my car, and you can use it now, but pay me next week at a fair price. That's a better way to put it. So it looks like we have a contract because bingo, you got my car and you're driving it around, um, and then next week you come and I say okay, the fair price is nine thousand dollars. And you say, whoa, 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 um, you had it up for sale for seven, so a fair price would be at least, you know, minimum or maximum of seven, maybe less. And, uh, and suddenly we have a contract to enter into a contract, and that term is, is um, <clears throat> the, the courts will say, uh, you know, no contract, all right? So just read that in the textbook. That, uh, I'll be... I'll, probably test you on vague offers, but I'm not going to test you on offer, uh, contracts to enter into contracts. Okay, so that's the first element of a contract, offers. Now we're going to get into acceptance. Um, <clears throat> just let me back up uh, for a sec here. Yeah, all right. Acceptance. Two key things here, an acceptance must be positive and it must be unconditional. Um, I just want to look at the next couple of slides to make sure I don't duplicate myself. Okay, back to acceptance. Um, what, what, what does it mean by positive? Um, <clears throat> uh, taxi, you put up your hand, the taxi can't hear you, but he pulls over. Um, this is, I want to hire a ta cab and his pulling over is his indication that he accepts your offer. Now, if you decide not to take the cab, it's not enough money for him to sue you over, but in effect, you've made an offer and he's accepted and nobody said anything, all right? But the actions are positive, all right? And then you go to a, a, an auction. Uh, how much am I bid for this? 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200 over there, 300, 300, anybody give me four, anybody give me four, four, four over here, 450 over here, okay, anybody give me 500, 500, 500, okay, 450, going once, going twice. He doesn't even have to say sold. The very fact that the hammer, the auctioneer's hammer hits the table means that that offer of 450 has been positively accepted. Okay, but generally it's verbal. I'll sell you my car. Uh, for $7,000. I accept. That's a positive acceptance. Um, when is it not? It was a really ridiculous old case uh, from the turn of the century, uh, 1900s, in New York. Um, lady owned an apartment block in a... Uh, uh, apartment. You don't own an apartment, do you? Um, a lady owned a suite in a um, building on P uh, Park Avenue. And a guy... Um, really wants to buy that suite. And he's confined to a wheelchair. But he really wants to buy that suite. And he keeps saying to the lady, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, I'll buy it. And she keeps saying, I don't want to sell it, I don't want to sell it. And he keeps upping the price, and upping the price, and upping the price. And she says something like, um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't consider uh, selling it for less than, let's say, $100,000. And he says, uh, too much. So he's rejected her offer, right? Now, he's sitting there and he's looking at her apartment because he's, he's renting a place across the street, right? And he's looking at her apartment and he watches her every day come out at 5 o'clock and walk her dog. And he keeps thinking, that's the apartment I want. Okay, $100,000. So he writes out an offer and he says, I offer to buy your um, suite for $100,000. I notice you walk your dog every day at 5 o'clock. So today, if you walk your dog at 5 o'clock... Um, I will take that as your um, agreement for acceptance, all right? Now, he did it that way because he's in a wheelchair, so he couldn't get across the street to give it to her. Um, anyway, he watches and watches, and the lady comes out and walks her dog at 5 o'clock. He goes, yeah, and he calls his uh, solicitor, and they draft up the papers, and they go over to her, and she says, I'm not selling my place. And he said, I made an offer, and you positively accept it by walking your dog. And she says, but I walk my dog every day at five o'clock. 
So he says, that you accepted my offer, and he sues her. <laughs> anyway, they go to court, and the judge says, all right, the lady walks her dog every day at 5 o'clock. Um, so if she... Um, that, that cannot be considered positive acceptance because the dog is used to going every day at 5 o'clock. So um, that cannot be positive acceptance. Now, had she had you said, if you walk your dog at 6 o'clock instead of 5, um, then I would consider that to be a positive acceptance. The judge said probably because she has changed something uh, in response to the offer. Um, but walking the dog at 5 o'clock which she always does, cannot be positive acceptance. Um, anyway, that gives you the idea of when it works and when it doesn't. Two types of contracts. There are unilateral contracts and bilateral contracts. Bilateral contracts are where both parties exchange promises and are bound from the outset. I will sell you my car for $7,000. You accept. That's a bilateral contract. I have not given you my car yet. You have not paid for it, but we have exchanged promises. All right? Um, so, uh, that's pretty straightforward, but a unilateral contract is a little bit different. Um, what we've got here is a situation where, um, one party says to the other party, uh, paint my house and I will pay you $12,000. The paint's there, the, uh, ladder's there, the tarps are there, the brushes are there, I'm going away on a trip. Um, if you want to paint my house, go ahead and I'll pay you $12,000. Um, if you don't want to, then uh, then no problem, all right? So uh, the person goes away and you think to yourself, mm, let me think, let me think. Um, hmm. Yeah, okay, I need the money. And so you start painting one side of the house. <whistles> then you get to the second side. <whistles> you get to the third side. You get to the forest side and you're about halfway. And I, I come driving back and I get out of the car and I walk over and I take the brush out of your hand and I go, and I finish painting it and then I pay you nothing. And I don't, and, and you won't be able to sue me. <clears throat> Why? Because a unilateral contract is accepted by performance of the act <clears throat> and you have not yet completed performance. So you haven't accepted, all right? So unilateral contracts could be dangerous. Um, and so what the courts have done is they have invented a clause in your contract. So um, you, you want to paint the house? There it is. I'll pay you $12,000. All, all the materials are there. Um, and you accept by doing it, right? Well, um, the, the courts have said, well, there's also a clause in that contract uh, <clears throat> called a subsidiary promise. Once the offeree has commenced performance, he or she has an opportunity to complete its his or her obligation. So, you know, I'm painting the house and I get to the fourth side and I'm halfway done. Um, and you come home and you say, okay, that's it. You haven't finished. Um, no contract. No, no, no. We didn't put that clause in the contract, but the courts say, obviously, for the efficacy of the contract, it has to have been there whether you decided to put it in or not. So then I do get an opportunity to complete. All right, and then you're bound to pay me. The concept of the subsidiary promise was invented by the courts in order to stop this sharp practice of stepping in just before the person is completed and preventing them from doing it and then saying there's no contract. So that's bilateral contracts, unilateral contracts, and the subsidiary promise that goes with it. Um, so what, what is a subsidiary promise? Well, when we do the contract drafting assignment um, and we discuss it, we're also going to talk about express terms and implied terms. And the express term of the contract is, I'll pay you $12,000, here's the materials, do you want to do the contract? Express term, yes I will. Um, but if it's a unilateral performance, then you don't expressly accept, so there's an implied term. A term of the contract which was not expressed but which the courts deemed to be a part of the agreement. Uh, so that subsidiary promise is an implied term. Now the leading case on this um, is one called um, the SS Lotus case. 
um, an English uh, ship, the SS Lotus, is coming into port. Um, uh, no, not SS Lotus, sorry. The SS Moorcock okay, um, is coming into port, and um, the ship's captain contacts the wharfinger, the guy that runs the wharf, the one who runs the wharf. And he says, uh, my ship is, uh, you know, so-and-so long, and it's got uh, a three-foot draft. Um, uh, can I tie up at your dock? And the warfringer says, yes, you can tie up to my dock and it'll be this much money. Uh, the captain ties the dock up, or the ship up to the dock. The tide goes out, the ship goes down, and a big rock punches through the bottom of the ship. The ship sinks. The ship owner sues um, the warfringer, and the warfringer defends by saying, I said he could tie up to the dock. I did not say it was safe to do so. Well, that didn't go very far in the courts. The judge immediately said there's obviously an implied term because he said it's got a three foot draft. Well, you know, it's also painted blue, you know, and it's it's got a big propeller and, a, and an engine. No, he said three foot draft. Why would he say that? Because he wants to know if the tide goes out, is it safe, right? So um, the uh, Warfringer was uh, was held to pay the damages for the ship on the basis of an implied term. Um, another example of where there is a, an applied term, and it also is the, um, uh, shows the existence of a unilateral contract, um, and is kind of interesting given the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic that's going on. Um, the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, <clears throat> um, influenza was a killing disease. <clears throat> and um, uh, Carbarlock Smokeball Company came up with what they said was um, uh, something that would prevent you from getting influenza. So what was it? Well, it was a, a wax ball with some sulfur in it and a wick. And the instructions were that if you went into a room and lit this basically candle and breathe the fumes, you would not contract influenza. It was good against influenza, the colds, snoring, coughs. It, you know, if COVID-19 was around then, they, they would have said it was a, a, a cure for that too because they were, they were convinced. This wasn't a scam. It was a substantial company with lots of product. They were convinced that the carbolic smoke ball worked. Um, and so they were so convinced that they put an ad in the paper and it said, um, you know, buy the carbolic smoke ball and use it in accordance with the instructions on the package. And if you contract influenza, um, we will pay you 100 pounds. Now, 100 pounds in 1900 was a huge amount of money. So they were definitely, definitely convinced that they had a cure. And they even went further and said, to show our sincerity in this matter, um, uh, we have put a thousand pounds on deposit with the um, uh, something bank, Alliance Bank on Regent Street. So that ad goes in the paper and along comes Mrs. Carlyle and she thinks, okay, that's a good idea. She buys the smoke ball uses it in accordance with the instructions on the package, still contracts influenza, and unfortunately for the Carbolic Smokeball Company, she survives. Lots of people didn't, but many did, and quite a number had used the Carbolic Smokeball. And so Mrs. Carlyle comes and she says she wants her 100 pounds. Well, all of a sudden this business is saying, whoa, wait a minute, we've got a lot of people looking for, uh, um, uh, for this money. And uh, we're going to go broke if they all get it. So they defend against Mrs. Carlyle. And um, they get into court. And this w and, and the um, counsel, the barristers for the Carbolic Smokeball Company, um, defend on the basis that uh, this is just an advertisement and it's puffery. Um, and the, the courts say, no, we're not accepting that because of the thousand pounds on and uh, Regent Street. Then 
they say, okay, well, um, Mrs. Carlisle um, did not accept our offer. Okay. And um, she didn't buy it and then come to us and say, I accept the offer as set out in the newspaper. Uh, this is merely um, an invitation to treat. Um, and <clears throat> and the, the judge said, uh, no, um, this is a situation where it's a unilateral contract. You didn't expect hundreds of thousands of people in England to buy your product and all come down to your office and say, uh, I bought your product, we're accepting your offer. So obviously this is a unilateral contract. All she had to do was use the product in accordance with the instructions on the package and that would be acceptance. Um, and so the concept of the unilateral contract uh, <clears throat> meant that uh, they, they were bound to this contract. Um, and this was an implied term that all, all she had to do was use it and then it would be acceptance. They didn't have to say that. All right. So um, that's uh, the Carlisle versus Carbolic Smokeball Company. They went out of business. Um, they struggled for uh, quite a while after that, but they, they finally went out of business. So the reason that this wasn't considered, I should back up, this wasn't considered to be an invitation to treat, okay, um, was because it went too far. Had they just put the carbolic smoke ball on, uh, in the newspaper and said, uh, you know, th three shillings, you know, th three pence or whatever, um, then that would have been an invitation to treat. And um, she, her buying it would have been uh, her offer. And then she would have, and, and Carlisle, Carbolic smoke ball would have had to accept, but in fact, um, it was not an invitation to treat because it went too far. It made an offer in the newspaper. Okay. Good exam question. Um, goods on a shelf are um, uh, <clears throat> with a price tag, or goods in a catalog with a price tag, or goods in the internet with a price tag are uh, invitations to treat, um, <clears throat> not offers. Um, with the exception of the Carbolic Smokeball Company, or Carlisle vs. Carbolic Smokeball Company case, um, why was um, uh, their advertisement in the newspaper considered to be an offer, not an, not an invitation to treat? It was because it was too specific. It went beyond just listing the price. Um, another really good example to bring that sort of more current, um, we used to have a store, a series of stores all around Vancouver called the Future Shop, and they sold electronic equipment. Um, and um, they were one of the first businesses to actually to um, try to sell online. So they set up a website and they put product on their website and uh, with price tags. And they put on uh, MP3 players, uh, and instead of saying 99 uh, dollars and 99 cents they said nine dollars and 99 cents <laughs> oh well <clears throat> everybody wanted to buy one of those so the first six people that went onto the site saw this and went wow that's a good price they put in their uh, credit card information and hit the complete button and uh, bingo uh, <clears throat> they were told it was accepted and then hundreds of other people tried uh, but by that time future shop had noticed the mistake and closed down the site so the uh, six people sued because uh, Future Shop said, no, that's a mistake. Um, uh, and, you know, this is an invitation to trade. It's a mistake. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we can correct it. Um, and the other hundred people, you know, were, were complaining as well. Well, the judges <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the case said, okay, yes, the goods on the shelf and the website with a price tag, are invitations to treat. The customer must make an offer, and it only becomes a contract when accepted. But the first six had done that. MP3 players, $9.99. Wow, that's an invitation to treat. I'm making an offer. Here's my charge card number. Future Shop says, transaction complete. They've accepted. So the first six people got their MP3 players. All the other people no, because they tried to buy, but it wasn't accepted. Okay, invitation to treat, attempted to buy, no buy, no uh, transaction not complete, no contract. The next topic 
is consideration. So we've done offer, acceptance, now we're getting into consideration, and I, I, I said there has to be consideration going both ways, right? It has to be a promise, not necessarily payment or delivery of goods. It has to be a promise. All right, so consideration is confined as the price for which the promise or act of another is bought. Um, I, I'll sell you my car for $7,000, um, and you say, okay, I accept. You're promising to pay me the money. I'm promising to give you the car. Consideration going both ways. Transaction complete. Contract. Um, now, uh, what about a gratuitous promise? Well, I say, um, I'll sell you my car for $7,000. And you say, oh, boy, I really need a car, and that's a really good offer, but... Oh man, I'm a struggling student and I can barely pay my fees and, 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 and so I say, oh, okay, all right. You're a struggling student. Um, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Okay, I tell you what, I will give you my car. So I, I offer you my car for free and you accept. Um, and I say, come by my place at five o'clock on Friday and I'll give you my car. Five o'clock on Friday, I come by my place and I say, oh, I'm sorry, I sold it to my niece. And you go, no, 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 you made an offer and I've accepted. I'm going to sue you. Can you sue me? Well, yes, you can. Anyone can sue anyone, anywhere, anytime, for anything. All right? But will you be successful? No, you will not. Why? I made an offer you've accepted. Yes. Your consideration was you got my car. What was my consideration? That warm, fuzzy feeling in the pit of my stomach, knowing I've helped helped out a struggling student? No, that's not considered consideration at law. So because I have not received any consideration, we do not have a contract. Okay, But let's say I say, um, okay, I'll give you my car um, <clears throat> because you're a struggling student. And you say, oh, no, I can't accept it for nothing, but here's a toonie, and you flip a toonie at me. Well, I'll dive across the desks and I'll push four or five other students out of the way to catch that toonie because I'm a lawyer and that's money. Uh, that's a joke. Anyway, um, you give me a toonie and I go, oh, come on, no, that's not enough. Well, in the eyes of the court, yes, it will be, okay, because it is some consideration. And the courts are not, con are not concerned with the adequacy of consideration, only that there is some consideration there. So um, a, uh, an excellent um, example of that is uh, I read in the newspaper, uh, the Los Angeles Times, that um, someone um, was going walking around his neighborhood. This was pre-COVID-19. And another fellow had a garage sale. The fellow's walking down the street and he goes, <whistles> and he looks at the stuff in the lawn and he goes, hmm, there's a, there's a sketch. Looks and he thinks that looks like a Picasso. So he says, um, "How much do you want for the sketch?" The guy says, "I don't know. Make me an offer." He says, oh, "I don't know. Twenty bucks." Phil has twenty bucks for a sketch with a picture. He says, "Sure, sold." So he gives him the twenty dollars and he takes the sketch and he pulls it out of the frame and he looks at the back and he goes, "Oh my God! It is a Picasso." And the guy at the garage sale says, no, I didn't mean to sell that. You know, give it back to me. You didn't pay me enough money. Um, well, obviously, the transaction is complete, right? The court said, he made you an offer and you've accepted. We don't care whether you made a good deal or a bad deal as long as there was a deal. All right. Um, another example of that, one hits a little closer to home, is I had a, a friend who, uh, well, the friend that taught at, uh, uh, at UBC. Um, I talked about him when we did the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> the lodge up north, right? Um, uh, pardon me, the human rights, uh, yeah, we, lodge up north, the human rights thing, and he was the, uh, he was the fellow that was accused of having, uh, uh, sexually harassed a, uh, person in his office. And anyway, um, uh, he, he's, you know, married, and he has, uh, three daughters, and, uh, place in North Vancouver and he had three cars 
Um, they had the uh, van for driving the kids around when they were younger. And then he had the uh, little uh, Ford uh, to zip out to the corner store and back to buy milk. Um, and then he had his toy. It was a mint condition MG convertible sports car. Um, <clears throat> and he, you know, he would, he, slightest bit of rust, bingo, he's there fixing it up. It's like just, it's, it's his toy. He would only drive it in the summer when it got really warm and it was sunny and he'd roll it out and he'd drive it and he'd never go over 30 miles an hour. Uh, otherwise you lose your muffler on an MG. He'd drive it to UBC and back uh, and then he'd put it away. Well, at work, um, one of the uh, instructors at, uh, at the University of British Columbia said, Brian, I need cash. I need it really fast. I've got a 1965 Ford Mustang convertible in, uh, in pretty good shape and I'll sell it to you for, I think he said... Uh, uh, what was it? Three thousand dollars. Just you know, I, I I need money cash fast. But I said, well, why don't you sell it? And he said, well, I don't have time, so I I need to sell it to you. Brian said, I can't um, I can't you know buy it. If I bring another car home, uh, you know, my wife will kill me. And he said, no, 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 you just buy it and then you know turn around and uh, sell it, and you can probably you know make a quick profit on it. But I need the cash now. I don't have time. So Brian buys it for $3,000 and he drives home and he comes in the driveway and his wife comes out and says, come on, sweetie, you don't get two toys like that. Brian says, no, no, no. I said, I have another friend. I'm just going to resell it, right? So he cleans it up a bit and he puts a, a notice in the uh, uh, in the newspaper, um, Ford, Fus Ford Mustang Convertible, 1965, good condition, best offer. Well, that's an invitation to treat, right? Um he looks out the driveway and there's a person walking around, looking at the car, kicking, kicking the tires. Brian says, uh, you know, can I help you? And the fellow says, yeah, I'd like to buy your car. How much? And uh, Brian says, um, $5,000. The guy says, $5,000? Okay, I accept. I'll go away and I'll get a certified check and, and you prepare the uh, uh, documents for the transfer. You know, Brian thinks, whoa, whew, quick two grand. Fellow goes away and Brian looks out the window and there's another guy out there kicking the tires. And so he goes out and he says, hi, can I help you? And the guy says, yeah. He says, I really want to buy your car. How much uh, do you want? And uh, Brian says, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's already sold. The fellow said, oh, darn, you know, how much did you get? And uh, Brian said, you know, $5,000. The guy says, $5,000? You're Kidding, I would have given it to you for $15,000. I mean, I would have bought it for $15,000. Well, you know, Brian's in the house and he's on the phone to his lawyer, me, <clears throat> looking for free legal advice. And he says, um, uh, you know, I haven't uh, given the guy the car and he hasn't given me the money yet. We don't have a contract, do we? Funny thing was, we both took this course at UBC um, in our undergraduate degree. We took it together and we bought one textbook and we shared the textbook. And when we were finished our university careers, um, <clears throat> the only textbook that we fought over and the only textbook that we wanted to keep was the, uh, uh, the business law textbook. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we flipped for it and he won. Okay. So I said, uh, oh, Brian, come on, you got the textbook. How about you read it? And he says, I have. He said, I'm bound to the contract because we've exchanged promises. It's a bilateral contract. And I said, yes, you're correct. And they said, well, what if I just don't sell it to the other guy? Um, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen? I said, well, I don't know if he was a car dealer and he knows how valuable it was. Um, he will sue you. And uh, Brian began to cry. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. But he said, oh, the guy gave me his business card. He's a he's a car dealer. OK, so. Um, he wound up selling it. He only made $2,000. Um, <clears throat> but there's no way he could have had that contract set aside because the courts don't consider whether you've made a good deal or bad deal. They just make sure that there has been some consideration in the contract. Um, the next topic is um, legal duty and consideration. Um, if you are already under a legal duty to perform a contract, then the offer of some consideration to do what you're already bound to do is uh, will be considered to be gratuitous. Uh, there's a sailing ship there in a you know a storm, uh, <clears throat> because this is an old English sailing ship case that set the law, Stilk versus Myrick in 1806. Um, 
the ship sails from the Eng from England to the West Indies, fills up with that good stuff, rum and tobacco, <clears throat> turns around and heads back. Well, it turned around to head back and it ran into a storm. And, uh, uh, and it's a really terrible storm. And the crew are so frightened that they're beginning to get the life, go to the life rafts. And they're going to get in the life rafts and leave the ship. The captain stands up and he says, double the wages for every man who stays with the ship. Well, even for these uh, seamen in those days who weren't the brightest bulbs in the string, um, this is a, an obvious uh, no-brainer. Um, you know, stay with the ship as long as you can. You can still go to the life rafts later. Well, the captain knew what he was doing. They got through the storm. They get back to England. Stilt goes into Myrick, the owner of the ship, and says, uh, I'd like my wages, please. Myrick pays him, and Stilt goes, no, no, no. You're supposed to pay me double the wages because the captain is your agent on the high seas, right? So there's a contract. I stayed with the ship. I get double. Myra kicks him out. Stilk sues. They get into court. Now, there's other sailors watching this court case. So although it's not a lot of money per se, for the shipping company, it is. When they get into court, um, uh, Stilk explains it to the judge, and the judge dismisses the case. And he says... Um, uh, you were uh, you were under a legal duty to sail the ship from England to the West Indies and back again. Um, so you breached your contract. Um, it, or you would have breached your contract if you'd gone into the life house. And he said, on the basis of consideration, uh, Myrick owes you only your wages. Why? Because... You're already under a duty to perform. What did Myrick get to have you do your legal duty? You were supposed to sail a ship. You did. So um, uh, there you go. Uh, consideration, uh, no new consideration coming to Myrick. Myrick is not bound by the contract. Um, I think my wife is out, so I'm just going to grab the phone, which you hear ringing in the background, and so we'll have a short break. All right, sorry for that uh, interruption. Um, we were talking about uh, legal duty and consideration and um, the case of Stoke versus Myrick, which is 1806. Um, a number of years later, in uh, I think it's 1862, there was another very similar case, a ship from England, sails down to the West Indies, fills up with rum and tobacco, turns around, it's coming back, it's caught in a huge storm. Um, this ship is leaking like a sieve, the water's pouring in below, they're bailing as best they can, the sailors are running around. Finally, they begin to go to the uh, life rafts, they're going to desert the ship. Captain says, double the wages for a man who stays with the ship. Well, again, it's a no-brainer. They stay with the ship, and if the ship goes down, they can still go to the life rafts. But they stay with the ship, and, and they slap tar and, and uh, canvas on the, on the leaks, and they keep bailing, and they get through the storm, and they get back to England. And um, Turner goes in to Owen, the, the, who owns the ship, and he says, um, uh, I, want, uh, uh, I want my wages. And Owen pays him what he's owed, and Turner says, no, 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 it's supposed to be double the wages. And, and uh, uh, Owen, uh, Owen says, nope, uh, and kicks him out, and Turner sues. Um, pretty much the exact same scenario. So Owen's lawyer uses Stilk versus Myrick as a precedent for, for the fact that um, Owen received no new consideration for the sailor to stay with the ship because he was already under legal duty to do so. And the judge goes, nope. Uh, uh, Turner gets double wages. And uh, the rationale behind that decision was um, that the Stilk versus Myrick case could be distinguished um, there was a legal duty on the owner of the ship to provide a seaworthy ship. They get caught in the storm, the, sea, the ship's leaking, it's falling apart. Um, obviously, it was not seaworthy. So at that particular point, there was a new contract that, which came into existence. Double the wages to stay with an unseaworthy ship. Therefore, Owen was getting consideration and Turner was promised consideration, so Turner got his double of wages. Well, those are ancient sailing cases, so, uh, you know, like what, what, what's that got to do with um, uh, modern days? Um, well, in the, uh, in the case of uh, Gilbert uh, Steele versus the University Construction 
um, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Ross versus Tosco. These are uh, cases where <clears throat> this whole concept, if you're already under a contract to do something, you cannot <coughs> demand to receive more to do the same contract. Um, there is, however, a proviso. And, uh, and that proviso uh, is in the, comes from the Ross's case. Uh, when parties to a contract agree to various terms, the variation should be enforceable without fresh consideration, absent duress, unconscionability, or other public policy concerns. Okay, so there is, there is a, a situation where um, you could um, uh, be offered uh, or, you know, demand uh, double, the, uh, double the payments um, and you, you'll, you'll get it. But the problem with it in modern days is, um, uh, is that in Canada there was a case called uh, Shadwell versus Shadwell. And um, uh, it's Shadwell versus Shadwell at all because it sounds like somebody's suing himself. But in, in actual fact, Shadwell was building an apartment block and people were going to move into it. One, one of them was her uh, or his aunt, um, also Shadwell. And the construction company had to get it done by a certain date and came to Shadwell and said, oh, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to get it done by a certain date. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's too much. We need to hire more men. You'll have to pay us more money. Shadwell goes, oh, no, okay, yeah, okay, sure, hire, uh, hire more people. And then when it came time to pay, Shadwell had talked to his lawyer and his lawyer said, well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. They were, they already gave you a price and they said they'd have it done by a certain date. They're legally bound to do that. They cannot then turn around and say, pay me more money to do what I'm already legally bound to do. And so Shadwell did not have to pay the construction firm extra money. Um, and that was the same in Gilbert Steele versus University Construction. Um, however, in the Roscoe case, um, it was slightly different. And, um, and so uh, they said, well, if, if both parties agree to vary the terms and there's no duress or unconscionability, then um, uh, then the court said that should be binding. So if you look back at Shadwell, the construction company comes and says, uh, pay us more or we won't get it done on time. What Shadwell had all these people moving into the building. They were leaving their other premises. They didn't have places to go in the meantime. They would have been suing them. It was unconscionable. It was almost duress to demand extra money. Um, and so in that particular situation, um, they would say, um, yeah, there's duress, and ergo, he does not have to pay the extra amount. But if the construction company and Gilbert Steele, or the construction company and Shadwell got together, and they said, you know, we're going to have a hard time getting it done by October, or June the 11th, and when Shadwell says, oh, okay, well, what do you need, and, you know, let's work together here, and, uh, and the construction company says, well, we'll do our best, but, you know, if you could hire more men, then we'll be okay. And he says, okay, we'll hire more men. Well, um, technically, they're already under legal duty to, um, to get it done by June the 11th. But, uh, you know, Shadwell was more than willing to work with them. No, no duress there, no unconscionability. Uh, and, and then that, uh, that, that would uh, be binding on Shadwell, and he would have had to pay. Okay, the next concept is um, uh, the concept of... Uh, past consideration uh, in the payment of a debt. And um, this uh, will be on the exam. Uh, this will be on the exam. Uh, this will be on the exam. And uh, oh, by the way, this will be on the exam. Why I'm being s emphasizing this so much is um, I practice law for, um, uh, for over 30 years. And in my practice, uh, because it was a part-time practice, uh, this topic came up. Uh, this or issues came up relating to part payment of the debt very often. Not very often. I shouldn't say that. Quite often. Okay. Often enough that I think um, business people should be more than aware of this uh, particular concept. Now, part payment of a debt goes back to this whole concept of consideration and whether there's consideration for a contract. Um, folks owed Mrs. Beer um, uh quite a sum of money, 2,000 pounds, 10 shillings. And um, uh, he said, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pay that. 
Um, and this was uh, back in 1884, and um, back in those days, it was uh, it was a real stigma on your uh, uh, business professional uh, professionalism to go bankrupt. Um, it, it pretty much meant that you'd you'd never be able to do business again. Banks wouldn't deal with you. People would be worried about you. I mean, you know, look at Trump. Trump down in the United States. I mean, he he went bankrupt, and bankrupt, and bankrupt, and he used it as a way of not paying his rightful debts, and people still do, deal with them, okay? So the stigma isn't as bad today, um, but back then it was a terrible thing to go bankrupt, and so folks was, owed a lot of people money, and he was trying to structure his affairs so that he could prevent from going bankrupt. He owed uh, Mrs. Beers uh, 2,090 pounds and 19 shillings, um, and he went to her and he said, look, I, I can't, cannot pay that. Um, uh, but he agreed in writing to, uh, with Mrs. Beers, and Mrs. Beers agreed this, to accept 900 pounds immediately and 150 pounds per month until the uh, sum was paid off. Um, but uh, she would forgo the interest owing on the money. And uh, uh, folks said, yeah, I can handle that. Okay, sure, we got a deal. So he pays the 900 pounds immediately and, um, uh, and then pays so much per month uh, until the debt's paid off. And then she sues him for the interest. Uh, and they got into court and the judge, and it went to the Court of Appeal actually in England, so three judges, and they said, um, uh, because Mrs. Beers received no new consideration, in fact, she received less than she was owed, there was no consideration to bind her to this agreement to accept part payment of a debt in satisfaction of the whole. Okay, so you have to understand that. Okay, um, he owed her money, he couldn't pay it all, he said he'd pay part of it. If she forego the, the interest, she agreed. Um, but what was she receiving? In order to have that agreement to receive less than she's owed, well, she's re receiving less than she's owed. So she's not receiving any consideration. So the judges said, that is the law. Mrs. Beers gets her interest. Well, they didn't like it. Okay. <clears throat> um, they said, uh, that's the law, but and, and there's nothing we can do about it uh, because the law is settled, but... Um, uh, uh, we wish it was differently. And so what the, what the Court of Appeal did was they outlined four things that folks could have done to make Mrs. Beer's agreement to accept less than she was owed binding, all right? Um, and the first one was um, you can pay uh, the full amount before the due date. So... Um, and, there, and the reason is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Because you get the money now, you can invest it, and you're better off. So there would have been consideration to Mrs. Beers. Um, the other thing is you could agree to pay um, a little bit of money and a, uh, an object, like a peppercorn or a tom tit, is what the court said. Now, a peppercorn is that thing you put in the pepper grinder, and you put it on your eggs. And a tom tit is an English bird. So what they were saying was if you agreed to pay part payment plus gave an object that was new, so it was new consideration, then Mrs. Beers would have been bound to the contract. Um, and the third thing was um, they could have a third party pay the debt. So folks says, um, uh, Mrs. Beers, I cannot pay everything, but my friend Peter Holton will pay part payment in satisfaction of the debt I owe. Because I owe nothing to Mrs. Beers, my agreement to pay part payment on behalf of my friend, Mr. Folks, would have been binding. Um, and then the last one is, had Mrs. Beers not just given this agreement in writing, but had given it in writing under seal, okay, then it would have been binding. We come back and we talk about uh, documents signed under seal later on. So I won't deal with that right now. Um, but anyway, what we've got is a situation where um, the court, the court of appeal outlines these four things that folks could have done. Okay, problem solved, right? Um, how many of you sit around uh, Saturday evenings reading court of appeal decisions and would come across and say, oh, look, we better remember that there's four things we can do if someone you know, offers part payment of a debt. 
you know, it's it, nice that they outlined it and, and now you know the law or you're deemed to know the law, but most people wouldn't know that. And so there were lots of situations where people were offering part payment of a debt and satisfaction of the whole, then getting sued and had to pay the full amount. Um, the court said that this was um, uh, uh, the law, but they didn't agree with it, but there's nothing they could do about it. Well, this, this bad decision in uh, England uh, wound up being used as precedent in Canada, Canada uh, in British Columbia, in a, in a case, um, uh, Cumber versus Wan, W-A-N-E or Wayne, Wan, Wayne, I don't know, but Cumber versus Wan. Same thing, offer part payment of debt, person pays part payment after the other person agrees, and then the other person sues, so the balance gets it. Um, the, uh, the court again in British Columbia said that uh, that's the law of consideration. They didn't like it, but that's the law. Well, in British Columbia, um, our legislature stepped in um, to try to remedy the situation. We have this statute called the Law and Equity Act, and uh, it has a number of sections on, a, on all sorts of topics where the court tries to give justice where the law does not do the right thing. Okay, so the law says folks has to pay the balance. Justice would say, well, she agreed to forego the interest so she shouldn't get it, right? But the law prevails. So the legislature in British Columbia passed and inserted a new section into the Law and Equity Act, and it's um, uh, outlined <clears throat> on, um, uh, I'm just going to bring it up a little bigger so that I can read it on the screen. It's outlined in section 43, and it says, part performance of an obligation either before or after a breach of it when expressly accepted by a creditor in satisfaction or rendered under an agreement for that purpose, though without any new consideration, must be held to extinguish the obligation. Ooh, well, okay, that's, um, that's solved, eh? Well, <clears throat> do we understand what that really means? Um, and I'm going to talk about a situation to explain it, another anecdote. Um, I had a client who uh, um, it was a printing firm, and they did a print job for someone. Uh, and it was a substantial print job. The total price was $14,000. But 11 months had gone by and the person hadn't paid for the printing, although the print company had delivered it and it was satisfactory. Um, well, <clears throat> what happened in that situation was uh, the, the client came to us and he said, oh, we've received this letter and a check from this guy. And he says, um, I've enclosed my check for $8,000 in full and final satisfaction of the uh, $14,000 I owe you. And... Um, they said, uh, you know, and so now we're stuck. We, you know, we don't know whether to, you know, if we cash the check, then we're going to lose money on the business. Um, but if we don't cash the check, this person is so slippery, we might not get anything. And I said, I don't understand your problem. And they said, well, <clears throat> the, you know, there's this law that says if we agree to accept part payment of the debt in satisfaction of the whole, then we cannot sue for the balance. And so, you know, we don't know whether we should accept this. I said, no, 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 but I don't understand. Why don't you cash the check and sue them? And they said, because the law says if we accept part payment. And I said, no, 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 the law does not say that. And if you go back to <clears throat> my slide uh, 98, I've bolded the relevant portions in there that we should remember. And one is that if you expressly accept, okay, so in this situation, what that business person is doing is he said, I'm sending you $8,000 um, and you are, ex you are accepting this as, as satisfaction of the whole. Um, but th that's not the way the law works. He can't accept for you. You have to actually say, I accept. Okay, you have to actually expressly accept. He owes you the money, cash the check. Okay, so um, they they cashed the check and they sued him for the balance in small claims court and they were successful getting the judgment. Now, I don't know if they actually ever got any money out of that person or not, but uh, they were at least successful in court, all right, because I did explain that you have to go through that problem of, of trying to collect on the judgment by garnishing or uh, registering against land or seizing assets um, uh, or having payment hearings, okay? So... That uh, that's a situation where you have to expressly accept. 
Um, there was another situation that I think is worth mentioning. It's on the same topic, and it gives you a little bit of advice as to what not to do in a, in a business deal. Um, it was a, my husband and wife um, clients that had the company that owned the two restaurants. Well, initially they had one restaurant, and it was incredibly successful. They had people lining up to get into it. So they decided to open up a second one, and it was going to be five times as big. And then eventually they were both literally that busy. It was such a good restaurant. Um, but anyway, um, they, they, when they were going to open this bigger restaurant, they were going to have a gala opening, a black tie and tails. And, and guys, that uh, has nothing to do with you know actual tails. Black tie and tails means you wear a tuxedo. Okay? And I received an invitation because I was their lawyer. Um, and I do have a tuxedo, and I've had it for years, and I wear it all the time. And guys, if you... Uh, you know, one fellow said, oh, I don't like wearing them because I feel like a penguin. That's because they have uh, really low self-worth. When you wear a tuxedo, girls think, wow, dynamite. Look at that guy. Um, I wear, we go on cruises and I wear the tuxedo and then we go in for dinner on formal formal evening. And when I walk into that restaurant and everybody begins looking at me in my tuxedo with my <clears throat> gorgeous wife in my arm, um, it, it's like... I own the ship, okay? So um, uh, so guys, get a tuxedo, wear it whenever you can. It's, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. Anyway, <laughs> back to the story. Um, I went to the gala opening, and, uh, you know, it was, it, it was a wonderful affair. There were candles everywhere. There was a string quartet. There was champagne. And they were, you know, had all sorts of uh, nibblies and hors d'oeuvres and things. And then as everybody left, they got a little bag full of their baked goods. Remember those baked goods that were so, so uh, delicious? Well, I got two bags because I'm their lawyer, and they try to keep their lawyer happy. Anyway, I went home, and I looked at the bag, and it was a brown bag with a green blob on it. And um, <clears throat> I thought, gee, that's kind of curious. Well, a couple of days later, I found out why there was a green blob on there. Um, Pamela called me up, and she said, um, I've got a problem. And um, uh, I ordered uh, bags for this gala opening, and I wanted brown bags with our green logo on it. And I went, aha. Well, what had happened was they were getting closer and closer to the opening, and she's very organized, and she keeps calling the printing company, and she says, where are my bags? Where are my bags? And they say, oh, yeah, no problem. We've got your bags. Don't worry. We'll get them there. And on the day of the opening, she says, where are my bags? And they say, we're just finishing them off. We're going to courier them down to you. So they hadn't tested the brown paper. They didn't have time, so they just printed the green on it, and the, the ink ran. And the, instead of the logo, it was a, a green blob. And they send it down to her, and she calls them up. She says, what am I supposed to do with this? And they said, well, you know, we're really sorry, but, uh, you, know, you know, it's a real problem, but, um, uh, you know, we didn't get to test the bags. And, and she said, but that's, I'm not, you know, I'm not paying you for this. And they said, hey, lady, you know, if you use the bags, you have to pay us. And she said, but I, this isn't what I asked for. Um, anyway, she had no, no choice um, because they couldn't redo them that fast. Uh, you know, and, they, and they kept saying, oh, this is you know, your problem. And it's not her problem, it's their problem. But anyway, uh, so she uses them and then uh, she calls them on the phone and she says, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pay you because I didn't get what I bargained for. Well, <clears throat> they say, you use them, you pay. She doesn't pay. And so um, they go to a collection agency. Now, this is years ago. Collection agencies are more highly regulated now, and I suspect they're better. But back in those days, they were, uh, they were pretty aggressive. You know, they'd phone you up in the middle of the night and say, you haven't paid your debt. I'm going to come over there. I'm going to reach down your throat, grab you by your heart, and beat you to death with it. Um, anyway, they, uh, they called up and they said, uh, you have to pay or we'll, we'll sue. And Pamela said, uh, you don't understand. They said, yes, you're a deadbeat. Um, and she said no, um, and she couriered over at her own expense the new bags that she had printed with the right logo, and she gave them a sample bag with a green blob. And the guy from the collection agency looks at it, and he goes, oh, I can see why you didn't pay. Um, so, um, yeah, I understand. And so she said, what I'll do is I'll pay for the bags. Okay, I'll pay for, what? for the bags because I use them, but I'm not going to pay for the printing. And he said, well, I'll go back and talk to the client. So the collection agency guy goes back and he talks to the client 
and, it, and the client says, okay, tell her if she pays for the bags and a little bit more, then, uh, then you know, we've got a deal. So uh, the collection agency tells her that, and so she agrees. Um, okay, I will pay this amount plus this amount, and the collection agency says, agreed. Okay, so this is an offer of payment of part in satisfaction of the whole. Um, Pamela <clears throat> sits down, and she's actually writing out the check to pay. That's, you know, how organized she is. The collection agency call, guy calls back, and he says, no, my client called up again, and he said, um, uh, no, he wants the full amount. And she said, well, no, I mean, you've already agreed to accept part payment of a debt, um, expressly agreed, as the statute says, right? But she didn't say that. She just said, you've already expressly agreed to pay, accept part payment. And he says, uh, yeah, lady, I know that and you know that, uh, but no one else knows that. And he said, I'll go into court and I'll lie. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, I'll just say you're a deadbeat and you're trying not to pay. Well, she got really mad and she hung up on him. And she called me and she said, uh, you know, what do I do? They, they expressly agreed, but I don't have any proof. And I said, oh, well, call her back. Uh, I'll probably call him back and uh, record the conversation. She said, I can't do that. And I said, why? And she said, it's against the law. And I said, is it? She said, isn't it? And I said, no, it isn't. Okay. Now, if she calls the collection agency fellow and somebody else intercepts their telephone conversation, that is inadmissible in a court of law and it's against the law, right? But if you're talking to someone, you can record that conversation because you're a party to that conversation, right? And she said, well, how will I do it? And I said, have you got an answering machine? And she said, well, yeah, on my desk. And I said, you see the little red button? And she goes, yeah. And I said, what's it say on the button? She says, uh, record. And she said, oh, will that record it? And I said, I'm pretty sure. So we practiced a couple of times. I would phone her and she'd hit the record button and yeah, it worked. So he pho she phones the collection agency guy and hits the red button and she says, look, um, you know, you expressly agreed to accept part payment of the debt in satisfaction of the whole. And he goes, yeah, I know, lady, but as I told you before, um, you know, I'll go into court and I'll lie. Butter won't melt in my mouth. You know, I've lied lots of times in court. You know, you'll be, I'll accuse you of being a deadbeat. And, and she gets it all down on tape and she says, well, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm not paying. So the collection agency sues on behalf of the uh, printing company. Different printing company, I should mention, because the first example was a printing company. This is a different printing company. Anyway, um, otherwise it would be a conflict of interest for me. Uh, anyway, um, she gets it in tape. He, they sue, and then they have the settlement conference. Remember when we went through the steps in a court action? Um, there was some... Um, uh, the world according to Peter Holden, there should be a demand letter sent out, but if they don't respond to the demand letter, then you file a notice of claim, they file a reply, um, there could be a counterclaim and a, a reply to the counterclaim, and then there's a settlement conference before trial. Well, they're having a settlement conference, and, and uh, um, Pamela calls the registry and asks for a tape recorder to be there. She attends, the guy from the collection agency attends, in walks the judge, and he sits down at the table, they go through the whole scenario. She's sit he's sitting there saying, this woman is a deadbeat. She won't pay her bills. Um, there is, I did not tell her that, you know, we would accept part payment. And then Pamela says to the judge, uh, with your permission, and she puts the tape in the in the recorder and starts paying it. And the fellow from the collection agency is looking at the tape, and then he's looking at the judge, and he's looking at the tape, and he's looking at the judge. And when it's over with, the judge looks at the... Uh, collection agency fellow and says um, would you care to change your story and um, of course he's a liar so immediately starts lying and saying that it was his client that was forcing him to do this and the judge says to him had you been under oath I would have you put in prison uh, for contempt of court um, and only released at my discretion you know, and the, the fellow's sweating, right? Um, and uh, I should back up and say that when you go to a settlement conference, you do not swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. You do that when you get to court. The idea in a settlement conference is they want people to be a little more forthcoming, and so they don't want to feel, um, uh, you know, constrained by, uh, by that oath. Uh, anyway, um, 
Uh, so the fellow says, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Um, I tell you, you know, yeah, my, my client will accept part payment. Um, and uh, Pamela at that point said, no, I don't think um, I want to pay anything. Um, we'll see you in court. And the fellow said, okay, okay, I'll just, you know, let's, let's, I'll sign a notice of discontinuance right here. So he signed a notice of discontinuance and, um, uh, and uh, Pamela didn't have to pay anything. Uh, and then I'm sure the collection agency guy went back to his client and lied about what happened, but uh, that's not our concern. That's his problem. Anyway, um, the, the upshot is that um, in your business dealings, uh, be honest, okay? Um, you never know when and how someone's going to find out that you're lying. And it seems like the only place where it doesn't matter is if you're the President of the United States, you can lie with impunity. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's uh, part payment of a debt, and it will be on the uh, exam, it, it will be on the exam, and uh, by the way, did I tell you, it will be on the exam, so you should know that pretty carefully. Next, next concept is um, quantum merit. Uh, this is obviously Latin, and it stands for the proposition that if no price is specified in a contract, and the contract has been performed, the courts will order payment of a reasonable amount for goods or services or payment of quantum merit. <coughs> um, example, um, you, uh, my, I go to my daughter and um, uh, I say, okay, uh, Bridget, um, uh, if you mow the lawn, I'll pay you some money. And she says, okay, Dad, and she hops on the lawnmower which um, would just, the thought of it terrifies me, okay. Um, she's, um, <clears throat> she's not the most careful driver. And of course, my other daughter, yeah, she'd get on the lawnmower and she'd do it like, at, at lightning speed. Um, so, but anyway, that aside, uh, they're lovely girls, they are really. Um, if, she, if, if she said, okay, Dad, and she gets on the lawnmower and she drives around, I'm looking out my window right now at my beautiful green lawn, nice sunny day here in Gibson's. She mows the lawn and then comes in and says, that'll be 50 bucks, Dad. And I go, oh, no way, uh, 20. She goes, 50, 20, 50, 20, 50, 20. I'm going to sue you, Dad. Well, <clears throat> uh, two problems with that right off the bat. One we haven't gotten to yet, and that is that um, we are uh, father and daughter, and the courts would say that we have no standing to sue because... Um, this was a um, non-arm's length transaction, a transaction between family and friends. And the presumption is that neither of us intended on entering into an agreement in which we could sue or be sued. But we'll get to that later on. The, um, what, <clears throat> what her, her immediate problem is no price has been specified. And so the courts will not grant her $50. Um, they may say 20 sounds good, or they may say some other amount. But they can decide. And then both of us, you know, my daughter had come in. She said, well, I've checked with some lawn mowing companies and they would charge, you know, $70, $80. And, and I say, well, you know, um, I've, I've been paying them $20 for doing it in the past or something. And then the judge makes up his or her mind. So <clears throat> that's because no price has been specified. But if a price has been specified, quantum merit does not come into play. So, for example, um, you ask me to uh, draft you a will. Um, and I say, okay, that'll be $1,000. And you go, oh, wow, mm, whoa, phew. that's more expensive than I expected. But, well, you know, okay, um, $1,000. And so I draft the will, and I give you my bill, and then you find out from your neighbor that they got a will done for $250. And so you refuse to pay, and I sue you and go to court. You are not going to be able to argue quantum merit. Okay. I'll pay a reasonable amount, but $1,000 is unreasonable. Be why? Because that, it, quantum merit only comes into effect if somebody has not specified a price. Okay, You made a bad deal, but the courts don't care if you make a bad deal. Only that there is some consideration going both ways. Okay, that's quantum merit. Then we get into um, the concept of a seal, signing a document under seal. And this is one of the situations where uh, it's really unfortunate that is, this is just a video lecture um, and I'm not doing it in the classroom. I have a box full of 
paraphernalia so that I can do a show and tell on this. Um, uh, a seal uh, stands for the proposition that it is your act and deed. If you sign a document and put a little red seal beside your name, um, you are the covenantor. Okay, this document now becomes called a covenant, and um, uh, uh, the deed is is the document under seal. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the significance of this? Um, the significance in modern law is that you no longer are required to receive any consideration. Mm -hmm. In the materials, in the lecture materials, I believe there is a copy of a contract from um, uh, a young lady in my class, and I've I just it, I remembered it uh, because we got to the seal business, and so I have to back up. Okay, um, to the screen. Uh, let's see, it's uh, ninety-eight. Remember those four things that the courts could do. They could, um, uh, you, uh, they could say you. Uh, not that the courts could do that. You could do. Um, you could pay the money in advance, or the, the agreed upon sum in advance. You could. Uh, uh, have a third party pay, you get an agreement signed under seal, and then the other one was that you could give part payment plus a peppercorn. Well, um, this concept of giving a peppercorn is actually something that has been used in um, uh, English law. And in that um, agreement that is in the materials and, and Someone email me and let me know if it isn't in there and I'll try to get a copy and post it online. My problem is that everything is in my office and uh, uh, and I really do, because I am in the high-risk category, not want to go there. Uh, but anyway, um, the this agreement was, well, let's back up. Uh, the Queen of England has all sorts of assets, land and buildings and jewels and things, and she cannot dispose of any of those assets anymore. She's prohibited by law of England to sell anything, okay? Um, and she cannot give it away. So um, it turned out that there was a flat, which is an apartment in London, that uh, was owned by the Crown, and the Queen wanted to give it to a family. Um, but she couldn't sell it to them, nor could she give it to them. So what she did was she said, all right, I will lease it to you for 999 years for one peppercorn. Okay, and um, so she isn't giving it to them because after 999 years, it goes back to the crown. She isn't selling it to them because after 99 years, 999 years, it goes back to the crown. And um, she uh, <clears throat> she has a, a, an agreement which is binding because the person gave the queen one peppercorn. Now that flat was sublet to a student in my class by whatever family owns it. And in there, they have nominal consideration. Okay, so um, a uh, you have an agreement as long as there is some consideration going both ways. So they sublet that flat to this student for 10 pounds all right so it's tantamount to ownership because um you're you know you're going to live for maybe 90 years so that's like one tenth of the the term of the lease right and so you can transfer it under your estate to somebody else and they can transfer it and transfer it and so on so it's tantamount to ownership but you don't actually own it all right so that idea of the peppercorn is used at law and that shows the adequacy of consideration because she gets this subcontract um, for a nominal sum. Um, and when I was, I was thinking about signing contracts under, under seal, that came to mind, so I wanted to just skip back and cover that because I'd forgotten. All right, so now we're back to uh, slide 100, use of a seal. Um, a seal uh, means, and, and that's the fourth category in, the, in what the Court of Appeal in England said you could do. Um, Mrs. Beers could have signed that agreement to accept part payment under seal, and then she would have been bound to it. She would have been bound to it even though she was receiving no consideration. Ah, so that stands for the proposition that uh, if a document is signed under seal, no consideration is necessary. 
Where does the seal come from? In uh, Seals were used by the Chinese, called chops, thousands and thousands of years ago. They used it in the Middle East, they used it in Greece. Um, it came into sort of legal use in England with, uh, you know, around the time of the Magna Carta when we saw that uh, um, the um, uh, King John signed the uh, Magna Carta under seal. Um, and so what we've got is a situation where um, in England, the seal began to mean no consideration is necessary because the king was bound. King John was bound to the Magna Carta, even though they didn't say, okay, here's 10 bucks, sign this agreement. He just signed under seal, which meant it's his act and deed and no consideration is necessary. Um, so um, let me put it this way. How many people in the class have a family seal, uh, a family crest. Um, because I have a lot of foreign students, maybe not very many do, um, but I remember when I turned um, 16, um, I was not yet an adult, but my father thought I was, uh, you know, getting more and more mature. So he took me down to a heraldry shop and we began to search the family name, you know, the, the ancestry thing is a big thing in the States. You can see all that, all sorts of ads on TV. Uh, <clears throat> this predated it and you had to go down, you had to look through, you know, binders and books and try to face, trace family relationships and things. We traced the family tree back so far and we got a crest um, with our, uh, our a shield rather, with a crest on it. And that was our family, family crest. And what it was, was um, a white shield with three red capes, you know, whoosh, capes like, you know, Batman or Zorro or whatever. And the shapes were in, and the capes were in the shape of a scallop shells, scallop shells. And there were three of them. And I thought, well, that was pretty significant because in, in my father's family, there were three children. And in my father's father's family, there were three boys. And in my father's father's family, there were three boys. And so I thought, well, three, that's significant. At the top of the crest was a bird, okay? And that's the moorcock. Remember the SS moorcock case? Well, apparently the moorcock has tremendous significance in English history. So that was our cape uh, and our shield. And, um, or pardon me, not cape, our shield and our crest. And the family motto, well, motto was neither timidly nor rashly, which means um, I'll kill you, but I won't do it with anger, okay? Um, and uh, and so that was that was that was kind of fun. Uh, later on, a number of years later, my father's brother went to England to actually trace our family tree. So we traced our family tree back to our ancestral castle. Well, okay, it wasn't so much a castle <clears throat> as a mansion. Well, okay, it wasn't a mansion per se. It was more like a manor. Well, oh no, okay, okay, okay. It was a cottage. Okay, it was a cottage with a dirt floor, all right? I am not in line for the throne. Um, but he traced her family tree. And um, as it turns out, our, our motto uh, is exactly the same, uh, neither rashly nor timidly, but our shield was different. The shape of the shield was different, and instead it had some red bars on it, and it had a mailed fist, an armored fist. I thought that's kind of cool. A lawyer, armored fist, your knight in shining armor. Anyway, um, that was our actual family crest, and um, uh, but our but our ancestral home was a cottage with a dirt floor. I didn't mind that so much because um, uh, John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States, that was assassinated in 1963, uh, before that had actually gone back to Ireland and traced his family tree, and it turned out he came from a, a family with a cottage with a dirt floor. So I still have a chance to be the president of the United States. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, so I found out what our, what our crest is like. Now, that crest um, was put on uh, signet rings, and it was also, uh, if you're too poor to have a ring, it was put on the end of a stick. And you would sign documents using that family crest. Now, if you want to know why, there was a really old case that we took at law school, and I got rid of all my law school stuff, and I sure wish I hadn't, because this is, this is really a, a cute case. Men, uh, 
not women because uh, uh, they had gotten their rights yet, but men were signing contracts back in those days, particularly concerning land, uh, when they couldn't read or write. So what would happen is um, a lawyer would draft up the document and then someone that one party trusted would read it and then the, uh, someone the other party trusted would read it. And once they were con uh, you know, convinced that the terms were, were what they wanted, there would be signature lines at the bottom. And they would sign with an X. Okay? The problem with that is a couple of years later, if um, that contract came into question and it went to court, the people had a hard time proving that the X there was theirs. And, well, maybe that's their X because, you know, they look the same. And, well, and then the judge would say, how do we know that you even signed the contract? So this, uh, uh, this came up in a, in a case one time where a, a fellow was signing it. And he turned to his adult son. And he said, son, I want you to remember that on this date, that X at the top on this document was mine. And, you know, the, the kid goes, yeah, yeah, sure, Dad. Yeah. He says, no, no, son, this is important. This is really important. you got to remember this. And the kid goes, yeah, 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 I'll remember. And so the father is not uh, satisfied, so he picks up a piece of wood, and he goes, whack! And he hits his son on the side of the head, and he goes, ow, what did you do that for? And he said, because I want you to remember that the X at the top of this document is mine. The kid says, okay, okay. Well, a couple of years later, they're in court, and... Um, uh, they're they're trying to prove this document, and the judge says to the the farmer, uh, "Is that your ex?" And the judge and the farmer says, "Yes." And the judge, says, "Well, how can you be so certain?" And he says, "I am certain, and I have proof." The judge says, "Oh, really? Um, what's your proof?" And he said, "And they call the son to the stand. He swears to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Help you, God." And then the judge says, "Is that your father's ex?" And the and the son says, "Yes, it is." And he said, "How can you be so sure?" The judge, and the son goes, see the scar on my head? Well, my father hit me on the side of the head and cut me when he said I should remember that the top X was his. The judge says, that's good enough for me, and he enforces the document, right? Well, <laughs> you can't go around hitting people on the side of the head every time you want them to remember what the contract is about um, or who signed it. Um, and so instead, they developed the practice that you would put your X there, and then you would melt some wax on the paper and you would take your signet ring if it was or signet ring and go psh in the wax or you would take your stick and go psh and you would leave the imp impression of your family crest there and that would mean that this was your act indeed and eventually it became so significant that no consideration was necessary in order to have you bound to that contract um let's see uh now, oh yeah, an aside, and it's unfortunate that I don't have the materials, but um, an aside is that um, when my uncle went to England and he found our actual crest, he had three pewter mugs made. And pewter mugs are those mugs that they use in, uh, uh, in pubs. You know, they're all in, they're all in, and they're drinking, yeah. um, and, uh, and this story, even though it's an anecdote and it sounds kind of funny, actually goes to this whole concept of consideration. I had this mug that was produced, and it was, it had our family uh, crest on it, and if you tipped it like this, it had a glass bottom. A pewter mug is nice and silvery, but it has a glass bottom. And um, I asked my students then, I'll ask you right now, does anybody know why? Okay. And I would be surprised if very, very, very many of you knew. Um, back in, uh, in the days of England, uh, having this huge empire, I uh, remember how it was so important in Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. Well, um, it was important to get lots of men into the Navy and into the Merchant Marine. And the way the uh, Navy used to do it is they would go around London uh, late at night and they would... Uh, wait until somebody came out of one of those pubs and they're you know they're drunk and they're going home and they would go whack and they'd hit them on the head with a trudgeon and the person would wake up on the deck of the ship the next day and the captain would say congratulations you're in the navy and that's it you've sailed away and you're gone for you know one easily maybe two maybe three years before you get back to england um and so yeah you're literally in the navy they were called press gangs because they pressed you into a contract. 
Um, well, one night, um, a, a lord, um, let's call him Lord Haldane, is out having a good time and he's slumming, you know, and he's down there in one of those pubs and he's having a good time and he's drinking, and he walks out of the pub and whack, he gets hit on the side of the head. He wakes up on the ship the next day. The captain's out and he goes, congratulations, you're all in the Navy. Oh my goodness, it's Lord Herschel or Lord Haldane. So they, they had to turn the ship around and go back and take the Lord back to England. Um, and then the Lord went in the House of Commons and he said, the practice of press gangs must stop. And he said, the only way that you can get people into the Navy or the Merchant Marine is by a binding contract. You have to offer them money and they have to accept. And so what the press gangs would do, instead of beating you on the side of the head, they'd go into the pubs and they'd be drinking there too. And you'd be drinking away, hey, you're drinking away. And without you noticing, they'd drop a crown, which is one of their coins, into the, into the, into the mug, right? And you'd go, oh, and you drink and you go, hey, what's this? And they'd say, congratulations, you've accepted the crown. Uh, that's our, our consideration. You're in, you're in the Navy. Okay, and then they'd take you away. Well, um, the practice began that they would put a glass bottom in the mugs and you'd be in there and you'd be drinking and they'd fill it up and then you'd say bottoms up bottoms up you ever wonder where that expression came from bottoms up because you'd hold the mug up and you would look to see if there was a crown or any money in the bottom of it and if there was you'd put it down and walk away no contract okay so um there you go. Something like a pewter mug with a glass bottom um, relates to contract law and the concept of consideration. All right, let's modernize this a bit. Um, on uh, slide 100, um, it shows you a picture of a document with a seal and that little uh, thing there is a, a stamp that you can impress your seal on the uh, uh, red um, a dot. Most of us don't have that and so we have a little sheet of paper and it'll have little little red dots on it and you peel one off and you put it on the contract and it's called a, a wafer. Uh, anyway, in uh, Royal Bank versus uh, uh, Kiska, um, there was a fellow by the name of Kiska who had a hairdressing salon and he owed money to the bank and I uh, needed an extension of his loan and the bank said, sure, but we need a guarantor. So that fellow offers his brother, Kiska, uh, and his brother comes in and signs a, 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 a guarantee. And, um, and uh, the problem with that, of course, is that the brother is getting a loan, okay, for his business. So he's getting a loan. He's going to pay back the loan plus interest. So there's a binding contract there. But what is the other brother, Kiska, getting for guaranteeing that if his one brother defaults on the loan, he's going to pay? He's not getting anything, okay? Um, and so... Um, he signs the, the guarantee and um, eventually his, governor, his brother defaults. And so the bank calls in this fellow to sign the guarantee and they have him in his office in the bank and uh, they say, you have to pay. And he's, he's really surprised because he said, you know, when I was signing this, it was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's very unlikely we'll ever have to, uh, you know, uh, go after you on the guarantee. And, and, and uh, it didn't seem like a big deal. <clears throat> and then he said, and, and I don't understand, what's this red thing beside my name? Well, when he signed it, they had not had not put the red seal on. So he went away. Now they're going to enforce it. And they're going to say, well, you signed it under seal, so no consideration necessary. <clears throat> the young kid is so upset that, that he uh, grabs the, the guarantee and he rips it up and he starts eating it. And suddenly the bank manager and then the custodian are grabbing him and they're trying to sloth and he's trying to eat it. <coughs> and finally, they, uh, uh, it's destroyed and so they make him sign another one under seal. Now, obviously, there's a bit of a problem here because it wasn't signed under seal when he signed it. And uh, then when he signed it again, it was kind of under distress dress right because he's in the bank and they're not let him gonna let him go until he signs it <coughs> so anyway he refuses to refuses to pay the bank sues him and they get into court goes to the court of appeal and there's three judges sitting and this is one of those cases that um, should be overruled 
because the two judges said, um, well, there is consideration which will bind the younger Kiska to the contract of guarantee because the bank forwent uh, their right of suing the older brother. So this uh, foregoing of your, your legal right, <coughs> pardon me, I'm going to have to take a cough candy just to finish this part of the lecture off. Um, the, um, uh, the, where was I? Um, the bank did not sue the older brother, and for not suing the older brother, this was consideration for the younger brother. Two of the three judges said, um, yeah, that's good enough. The third judge, um, Boris Laskin, Justice Boris Laskin, um, was one of our all-time best judges. From the Court of Appeal in Ontario, went on to sit on the Supreme Court of Canada. Very, very well-reasoned decisions all the time. He said, no, that guarantee should not be binding because for a guarantee to be binding, it, the seal has to be on there. This is very important. At the time or before the contract is signed. Remember that for examination purposes. Okay, one second. <clears throat> All right. So that quick uh, <clears throat> use of the uh, cough drop should uh, get me through this part. So anyway, you have a situation where the, the seal has to be on at the time or before the contract is signed, and it wasn't in this case. Um, the second signing was obviously under duress, so that shouldn't be valid. And then he went on to say, um, the bank, uh, the other two judges claim that the the fact that the bank for forwent the right to sue the brother was uh, was valuable consideration to the uh, younger brother, but that wasn't part of the original deal. When he signed the contract of guarantee, had they said we will. Uh, we will not sue your brother um, as uh, consideration for you signing this, then it would be bound to it, but it wasn't part of the deal, okay? It was just if his uh, brother um, couldn't pay, then then he could, he would. And under that situation, he's not receiving any consideration. So he said it was a bad decision. Well, it has not been overturned, um, but what what's happened is um, other jurisdictions would not follow the case but what they would do is, in a British, uh, British Columbia case, one of the judges said, uh, Boris Laskin's comment on, f on uh, th the fact that the, the guarantee will only be binding if the seal was on there at the time or before it was signed is good law. And so they've sort of ignored the uh, two decisions of the, or the decisions of the other two judges, rather than saying they are overruling that case. Um, and, and of course, uh, a BC court could not overrule an Ontario court anyway, and so that left them the right to follow parts of it that they think is is appropriate and good law. So the bottom line is that contracts signed under seal no longer require consideration in order to be binding. Um, <clears throat> a very, very important concept. Um, contracts are signed under seal all the time. Um, you go in as the shareholders of a corporation. The corporation is going to get a loan. Okay. Um, the bank says, yeah, we will lend the money to the corporation. Um, and the corporation has to pay back the money plus interest. But if the corporation cannot pay the money back, then we want the um, directors or the owners of the corporation to sign uh, contracts guaranteeing that they will pay. Um, okay, <clears throat> that's uh, that's consideration, and the next concept is um, uh, is the fourth element that we talk about in binding contracts, and that's um, uh, intention to create legal relations. <clears throat> Pretty obviously, um, I'll sell you my car for seven thousand dollars. I'll buy it. We intend to enter into contracts. So they're talking about situations where it's not quite that clear. Um, and <clears throat> they've developed rules over time. Balfour versus Balfour is an old English case which stands for the proposition that agreements between family um, members um, is considered non-arm's length. And as I mentioned when I was talking about Bridget mowing the lawn, um, <clears throat> those are not binding uh, generally because um, the 
courts presume that those parties did not intend to enter into an agreement in which they could sue or be sued. <clears throat> um, that was between a husband and wife. Um, question between a parent and a child was decided in the uh, Jones versus uh, Pada, Padavatan case. Um, and so it's binding there too. And there is a presumption, although I could not find a case on point, is a presumption that agreements between close friends are the same. Uh, they do not intend to enter in an agreement in which they could sue or be sued. Okay, so that's non-arm's length transactions. But what happens if you want to enter into a contract with a family member and you do want it to be binding and you do want to be able to sue? Um, are you out of luck then? Um, and the way you get around that is um, you show an intention to create legal relations. Um, when I became a partner with uh, that uh, Mackay, Turlock, and, and Holden uh, law firm, um, <clears throat> I had to give them some money and um but i you know not very much boy it was you know a nominal sum it was a really good deal but anyway i even even that small amount which i could pay out of my bank account i didn't want to do until i talked to my accountant and i talked to my accountant and, and he said um oh borrow the money from a bank <laughs> and i said why and he said well look he said and the interest rates then were about uh uh three percent on loans i think so he said, well, you know, what you can do is um, you can borrow the money from the bank um, and pay it back at 3% interest, and that interest is tax deductible, okay, as a business expense for you. Because you can do that, um, and you keep your own money instead of using it, you can invest your money, and you can get 3% interest. So... It's tax deductible, and you're taxed at about 50% rate, so that means only 1.5% is being paid to the, uh, the government, which means if you make 3% and you're only paying 1.5%, you're 1.5% ahead. I hope you followed that, because I had a hard time following it too. But I understood what he meant, and I thought, okay. But I still could not bring myself to um, borrow money from a bank. So I thought, well, I'll borrow money from my dad. Okay, and, and you know, I'll pay him 3% and, and I'll take my money and put my money and, and then because it's an interest deduction, I'll, I'll be a percent and a half ahead. So I called up my father and he said, oh, Peter, he said, don't worry about it, I'll just give you the money. Pretty nice, eh? Anyway, um, <clears throat> I, I said, no, 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 and I explained why I wanted to do it. So he said, oh, okay, sure. So I drafted up an agreement. James Ernest Holden, party of the first part, here and after referred to as dad. Peter James Holden, party of the second part, here and after referred to as son. And dad agrees to lend money to son for interest payments, blah, 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 blah. And then we got down to the bottom, and I put in a line where he had to sign under seal, getting someone to witness his signature. And I had to sign under seal, getting some person, uh, getting some person to witness it. And I did that, and then I sent it off to him with instructions that he should sign both and send my copy back to me, and then he could keep the original. Well, he gets it, and he calls me up, and he goes, Peter, Peter, he said, I got the agreement. You didn't have to do that. I trust you. You're a lawyer. <laughs> and I laughed, and I said, Dad, um, two things wrong with that. Number one is never trust a lawyer. That's a joke, by the way. And number two, I would have preferred if you called it and said, I trust you. You're my son. <laughs> he only trusted his son because his son was a lawyer. Um, <clears throat> that aside, it was a bit of a joke. I explained that, uh, that uh, no, I, I needed it uh, formalized. Um, anyway, I sent him post-dated checks, and I had to phone him up and tell him to cash them, um, which he did. Um, and then I got to the end of the year, and I'm going to file my uh, taxes, uh, my tax return. No, I gave it to the accountant, and I said, you file it. And the accountant files the tax returns, and then, um, sure enough, the um, tax department denies the interest deduction. Non-arm's-length transaction. It's between a father and a son, right? And my accountant sends him in a copy of the agreement, signed, sealed, and delivered. Get another notice back from the government. Tax deduction allowed. So I had to demonstrate my intention to be legally bound to an agreement on which I could sue and or be sued in order to have it accepted by the tax department. Okay, so you can get around that rule. Now, um, arm's length transactions, uh, and, and then we'll finish off there, um, and I'll just talk very briefly about the, uh, the second chapter. Um, the um, arm's length transactions are between two people who are 
um, doing business and they're not related or they're not close friends. And um, I, we're going to look at three cases. Uh, the first is um, uh, Higgins versus Lissig, which is an American case which was for years used as precedent for this concept. We don't usually use it American law, but this one was very clear. Uh, so there was a farmer who had some farm hands, and one of them, uh, and he thought he treated them really well. So when one of them stole a bridle, he was really upset. And he slammed down his fist and he said, um, I'd pay $100 to the man who points out the thief. Well, Higgins was there, and he said, I know who it is, it's Bob. Okay, so there's just the three of them there. So they go to, with Bob to the, the bunkhouse, and they check under his mattress, and Bob was so dumb that he hid the bridle under there. I don't even know if his name was Bob, I'm just using that. Anyway, they catch him and he goes to jail. Um, the bridle was worth $15. Uh, Lissig offered a $100 reward for someone to point out who the thief was. Higgins goes to Lissig and he says, I want my $100. And Lissick says, what? You've got to be kidding. You, th you, th you didn't think I was serious. And Higgins says, hey, you made an offer. I accepted your consideration. You just got Bob. My consideration is I get 100 bucks. Lissick won't pay, so Higgins sues them. They get into court, and the judge says, all right, Bob's in jail. Be a bad witness anyway. So all I have is Higgins' word and Lissick's word. And so how do I make a decision? Okay, now he has to on a balance of probabilities. Remember that? Um, so Higgins, um, so anyway, he says, well, I guess what I'll have to do is I'll have to pretend that I was in the bunkhouse too, and I was leaning against the wall, and I watched this exchange. Would I consider that what Higgins said was a bona fide offer, or was it the exaggerated exclamation of an excited man? Well, think about it. Oh, I'm going to kill him. We say that quite a bit, but if we actually killed everybody we said we were going to kill, there wouldn't be a population problem in the world, right? So um, the judge said, no, it was an exaggerated exclamation of an excited man. Well, that's fine. Um, then they get into um, uh, Carlisle versus Carbolic smoke ball case, which we've just talked to, um, and they had to decide whether that was a, a bona fide offer. Okay. Um, uh, or was it uh, puffery? Was it exaggeration? And the, the English, this is the United Kingdom case, so the English take the position that what you do is you look to the average person on the Clapman omnibus. Clapman omnibus is just a bus, a, you know, a transit bus. And so they say, well, you take the average person and you say, what would he think if he saw the exchange? Okay, so <clears throat> American law, the judge says, what would I think? English law, what would the average person on the Clapman omnibus think? Okay, and then we came to the Canadian law, and, and this was in the case of uh, I know, uh, Orisso versus Cardina. And um, Madam Justice McLaughlin was then a BC Supreme Court judge, and she went on to go to the Supreme Court of Canada, and she was like Laskin, or fantastic judge. Um, and when she, she said this, well, What we have to do is you have two parties. So what would, what would the, uh, let me think, yeah. <clears throat> Someone makes a promise. Uh, oh, you know, I'll pay a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars. What would the promisee think? Would he think it was a bona fide offer? And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of silly because <clears throat> obviously Higgins would say it was a bona fide offer. And then when I read it and thought about it, no, no, she wasn't saying what would the promisee in this case think, but what would a promisee think? Which means instead of the judge, instead of the person on the Clapman omnibus, what would a person who had just been told that think? Uh, would they think it was a bona fide offer or would they think it was an exaggerated exclamation of an excited man? Um, and so they all get to the same place they just do it a little differently, and I thought it was kind of an interesting scenario. Um, all right, so I have been uh, talking for uh, quite a while, so let me just see where we are here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been going for an hour and uh, seven minutes in this episode, and then there was some time previous to that, wasn't there? So um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here, 
and um, I'll do uh, another video a little later on uh, so that you can have a break. Okay, thank you.